Alright yeah, and welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. Apologies for the late upload of these videos, I've been very busy this week so I have not managed to get the decks out on time or at least not record the videos anyway. So, this week's deck is brought to us by Brian Primley, it's a mono black uh, mid-range beatdown kind of deck so thank you very much for sending in the deck. If you do want a, your deck to be featured in a future episode as well then be sure to send it to me, you can either do it in the comment section below, send it to me via email or on Twitter, whichever one's fine with you is fine with me. Anyway guys, let's get into the deck shall we? So. Mono Black Beatdown. Essentially, it uses the best of all the black cards in the game, as well as a fair few colourless artefacts as well that have a nice little bit of a synergy with the deck. So it's playing a lot of really powerful cards, and we're just hoping to play a lot of them over and over and over again and just slowly grind out our opponent. So if we go right to the beginning of the deck, we've got Gifted Etherborn. So for two black, we get a 2-3 Death Touch with Lifelink. Uh, speaks for itself really is a really powerful creature for uh, its mana cost right a 2-2 two, two, a 2-3 two, two, sorry 4-2 is fairly bog standard but to have death touch and lifelink as well makes it a great blocker and also helps us survive the late game as well if they're playing aggro it'll slow them down so much so yeah the death touch will deter them from attacking with big creatures the lifelink will stop them from attacking with little creatures because they won't be benefiting from losing their creatures as much, so it's really good for that kind of thing. Next we have Scrap Heap Scrounger, 2 mana, 3, 2, artifact creature, and it cannot block. However, you can pay 1 and a black to exile another creature card from your graveyard and return it to the bat from the graveyard to the battlefield. So, this is a constant threat for our opponent. A 3, 2 for 2 on turn 2 is pretty good as it stands anyway. We can start the beat down quite early. This deck is quite capable of going aggressive as well, which is a lot of fun. But it can also survive the late game as well with a lot of bigger creatures. But Scrap Heat Scrounger comes in a lot of uh, help. It allows us to crew up our Smuggler's Copters. It also allows us to sack it to things like our Distended Mindbender as well. We can emerge it and get the creature back for no value. We can also use it as a looting target as well. Uh, we can put it in our graveyard with Smuggler's Copter and then just pay the two to get it back anyway. So we're not losing any uh, value from the discard on the Smuggler's Copter. So Scrap Eat Scrounger is really awesome. Next we've got Smuggler's Copter. So this is a pretty great card for any creature focused deck and this is no exception really. A 2 mana 3-3 three, three artifact vehicle with flying. Whenever Smuggler's Copter attacks or blocks, you get to draw a card. If you do, discard a card. And it has Crew 1 as well, which means every single creature in our deck is capable of crewing the Smuggler's Copter. So, this guy you really want to get down as early as possible. Recently banned in Standard because it's so broken. Because you can essentially just um, set up your draws from the very beginning of the game to make sure that you're not getting flooded, you're not getting screwed on mana, that kind of thing. So as long as you can keep getting in with Smuggler's Copter, you can keep setting up your hand to be as perfect for the matchup that you're against, which is pretty awesome. We then have Implement of Malice, a two mana artifact. It says pay black, sacrifice the Implement of Malice. Target player discards a card. You get to activate this only on your turn. And when you put it into the graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card as well. So essentially we pay three mana for our opponent discarding a card and we draw a card. So it's really good if we are uh, screwed on mana. Also if our opponent has one card in hand and maybe we know what it is or they've been holding on to it for a while we can get them to drop it. We can really eat away at our opponent's hand and give us some card advantage essentially which uh, in black isn't easy to do so. Lots of discard is pretty cool. We then have Grasp of Darkness so for two black and instant speed target creature gets minus four minus four until the end of the turn so it's not hard casted removal or just hard removal in itself but it is um pretty decent it can kill most creatures in the format except for later game stuff like your kozlex and your uh, ulamogs things like that but um yeah giving a creature minus four minus four gets rid of kalatas it gets rid of i mean it gets rid of a lot of cards in our deck it gets rid of yeheni that could be indestructible it'll get through indestructible which is pretty sweet Gets rid of Galatas for the 4 Toughness, that kind of thing. Gets rid of Guilt Leaf Winnower. There's lots of targets for Grasp of Darkness, and it's really good for the early game as well. If your opponent's playing an aggro deck, uh, grasping off some of their early game aggressive creatures like the Hanweir Garrison and stuff like that, really valuable and can seriously slow your opponent down to the point where we get to stabilize and take over the game. 
We then have Yen Yehene, Undying Partisan, so for two and a black legendary 2-2 creature with haste. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a 1-1 counter on Yehene. You get to sacrifice another creature as well, and give Yehene indestructible. So, we'll be working towards making Yehene quite large as well, but a 3-3 three, a three mana 2-2 two -two with haste is pretty good. Um, but we can also make it into a larger creature as well. And once it's a lot larger, opponent's going to start throwing removal at it. And then we can start sacking creatures. Yet another reason why Scrap Eat Scrounger is so good. Because we can use Scrap Eat Scrounger as the sacrifice target. So we're not getting rid of quite nice valued gifted etherborns and things like that. So it's really good for that kind of thing. And we have a lot of removal in this deck as well. So there's a really good chance that the, uh, the first ability on Yeheni gets triggered several times before he dies. Which is pretty good. We then have Oath of Liliana, so for two and a black legendary enchantment. When Oath of Liliana enters the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a creature. At the beginning of each end step, if a planeswalker entered the battlefield under your control this turn, you get to put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. So this is essentially a fleshbag marauder in an enchantment. The only reason we're not really going with Fleshbag Marauder is mostly because we get that little bit of extra value from playing our Planeswalkers as long as there's an Oath of Liliana around. Um, is an argument for using Fleshbag instead for things like sacking, uh, exiling to a Scrap Eat Scrounger in the graveyard and that kind of thing. So it's personal preference really, but I, I debated it and I ended up going... Uh, deciding that Oath of Liliana was just the better option in this deck. We do only have two Planeswalkers, so it's not going to trigger the second ability that often, but just having it around for those extra occasions to have a wider board state that we can use is pretty sweet. We then have Murder, so this is our hard removal for one and two black instant speed, destroy target creature. Speaks for itself really, can kill anything except for if it's got hexproof or indestructible. Or probably something else I'm missing, but for the most part can get rid of absolutely any creature we want So if we have our board wipes for example like our languishes and languish wouldn't hit it or our grasp of darkness We've got murder to clean up the board straight after a board wipe, which is pretty good We then have read the bones two copies of this so for two and a black sorcery speed We get to scry two draw two and lose two life So we get to scry look at the top two cards of our library and we get to choose if we want to keep them or not. If we don't, we put them at the bottom and then we draw two and lose two. It's pretty sweet. Allows us to filter through our deck. Go about four cards deep for three manners. Not too bad. If we obviously want to scry both of these to the bottom anyway. So if we're mana screwed on turn three and we really need those lands, then we can scry for them. If we really need an answer like hard cast removal, we can go find it. That kind of thing. So maintaining card advantage, especially when we're stripping our opponent's hand from time to time is really good. We then have Liliana the Last Hope for one and two black, a three loyalty planeswalker. A plus one ability is a nice little bit of removal against tokens and smaller creatures as well in aggro strategies. So by turn three, we can start wiping our opponent's board if they're playing an aggro deck that uses a lot of one toughness creatures. Um, so up to one target creature gets minus two, minus one until the end of the turn. You can also protect her as well if it's a two power creature then it can completely disable a creature off the board even if it doesn't kill it, which isn't bad. Her minus two allows us to put the two, top two cards of our library into our graveyard, and then we get to return a creature from our graveyard to our hand. So if we ended up losing our Yeheni or some sort of other creature, maybe like Kalatas, and we want that value back, we can actually minus two and grab it back as well. There is a little bit of self-mill, so there's always that chance that we hit a card that we really wanted that we can't get back with Liliana. But it's the price to pay. You only really want to do this if you know that there's a target uh, in your graveyard to grab. Or unless you're desperate. That kind of thing. Her minus 7 ability, her ultimate, is pretty sweet. You can still win through it um, from an opponent's standpoint. But for the most part, uh, this is a great way to end the game. You get an emblem with, at the beginning of your end step, you get to put X22 black zombie creature tokens onto the battlefield. Where X is 2 plus the number of zombies you control. So... If our board is clear, the first time it triggers, we get two zombies. The next time it triggers after that, we've still got two tokens around, so we get four zombies that turn. And then it just spirals out of control from that point. And eventually, we end up having so many zombies that our opponent cannot possibly uh, block enough of them to survive. But as I said, there are ways to get around this for your opponent. A board wipe, for example, just clears this and starts us on our cycle again of going through to two, to four, to six, that sort of thing. So... 
it's not the best ultimate, but it's certainly not the worst. And there have been several occasions where Liliana's ultimate did without uh, any sort of resistance whatsoever and just won the game all by herself, which is pretty sweet. We then have Erebos' Titan, so for 1 and 3 black, we get a 5-5 five, five giant. As long as your opponents control no creatures, Erebos' Titan is indestructible, which means it cannot get destroyed by hard casting removal, that kind of thing. No burn, no nothing like that. Whenever a creature card leaves an opponent's graveyard, you may discard a card. If you do, you get to return it from your graveyard to your hand. So, there's been a lot of Scrappy Scroungers and a lot of graveyard recursion recently, so... Uh, Erebus's Titan's bound to actually be able to use that secondary ability. So if Scrappy Scrounger, for example, came out of our opponent's graveyard, we'd be able to discard a card and get a 5-5 back, which is great value for us. So that's why we're running it. It's also 5-5 five, five for a 4 that's potentially indestructible, which is a super creature, in my opinion. Next we have Kalatask, Traitor of Get. So for 2 and 2 black, legendary creature, Vampire Warrior. It's a 3-4 lifelinker and says if a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, instead exile that card and put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. And then we get to pay 3, uh, 2 and 1 black to sacrifice another vampire or zombie, which could include one of the tokens, and we get to put 2-1-1 counters on Kalatas. So we get to make our lifelinker even better, which is pretty sweet. Force some chumps, get some more zombies, and it just gets out of control quite fast. Kalatas is actually quite good with uh, Yeheni's expertise, actually, uh, because this is a 4 mana that only deals minus 3, minus 3, which means Kalatas can actually survive through it, and if our opponent's creatures don't survive through it, then we get loads of zombies as well straight after for each one that died, which is awesome, and Yeheni then gets to do lots of other interesting things, so Kalatas is super broken, super awesome. We then have one copy of Languish. The only reason we're running one is because we're running two Yeheni's Expertise. We have three board wipes in this game, in this deck, which is pretty sweet. I think they're quite useful. But this Languish is here for when minus three, minus three is just not that good. Because there are obviously a lot of four toughness creatures that we want to get rid of. So Yeheni's Expertise is not always going to be the best board wipe for the deck. So as a bit of a hedging of bets, we've ended up putting a single Languish in here just for those matchups where... Uh, four toughness creatures are what we have to deal with, but there you go. We then have Yeheni's Expertise, so for two and two black, all creatures get minus three, minus three until the end of the turn, so this is a nice board wipe. It's not as powerful as Languish um, as in terms of wiping the board, however, it does have an added ability. We get to cast a card with converted mana cost three or less from your hand without paying its mana cost, so we could wipe our opponent's board and then immediately play anything from here backwards. So if our opponent's creatures don't all die to the board wipe, then we could play a murder. We could play our Liliana for free and then start plussing to get that minus one, which is essentially languishing um, one of the creatures as well. We could read the bones for free, that kind of thing. There's, oh, there's so much stuff we could do that it uh, has a lot of value in it. A lot of the times, this is actually going to be useful to us. We then have Guilt Leaf Winnower, so some more removal. You may notice a, a sort of a, uh, you know, a, a nice theme going on in this deck. It's that most of the things in this deck seem to remove something while adding stuff to our board. So that's where we sort of gain this little bit of advantage and slowly tilt our opponent out of the game. So for 3 and 2 black, we get a 4-3 with Menace, which means it can't be blocked except for by 2 or more creatures, which makes it a great attacker and potentially great at clearing up our opponent's board as well. We could two for one with a Guilt Leaf Winnower. However, there is an added ability to Guilt Leaf Winnower. When it enters the battlefield, we may destroy target non-elf creature whose power and toughness are not equal. So that can hit Sylvan... Oh no, it cannot hit Sylvan Advocate, sorry. But it can hit things like Kalatas and stuff like that. As long as their power and toughness is not the same, then we can kill it. But for the most part, it's a 4-3 Menace for 5 mana, which is not too bad that we end up getting to destroy a creature as well. We then have Sky Sovereign console flagship. So for five mana, a 6-5 legendary artifact vehicle with flying. Whenever Sky Sovereign enters the battlefield or attacks, he gets to deal three damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. So this is really good for your super friends matchups. We get to start pinging off our opponent's planeswalkers and hitting them with the 6-5 in the air as well. So it's really there for that kind of matchup. 
We can also start clearing up our opponent's creatures as well. Unfortunately, we can't point this three at our opponent. I think this card would be stupidly broken if you could point it wherever you wanted, but, you know. Uh, we can't always get what we want. But Sky Sovereign that has a Lightning Bolt ability on it whenever it attacks or enters the battlefield is pretty sweet. We then have Obnixilus Reignited. So for three and two black, a five loyalty Planeswalker. His plus one ability allows us to draw a card and lose one life. So we can start getting card advantage, which is usually lots more removal. To keep the board clear, keep Obnixilus uh, safe from harm, which allows us to get close to his ultimate. His secondary ability is his way of protecting himself. For minus three, is essentially murder. We get to destroy target creature. Kill whatever we want, as long as it's not indestructible or hexproof, that kind of thing. And then he's minus eight, uh, can win the game quite quickly uh, under the right circumstances. Target opponent gets an emblem with whenever a player draws a card, you lose two life. So our opponent loses four life every turn cycle, essentially. By the time you've ultimated, I would hope that you wouldn't be um, too far off from dying in a couple of turns. You'd imagine that worst case scenario, your opponent would be on like 12 life or something like that. So they'd be dead in three turns after the ultimate. That kind of thing. So if we can draw more cards as well, then we can trigger this several times, which we do have ways of doing that, of course. Read the bones, draws us two cards, which is four life off of that trigger. And then we've got our implements as well, which is another two life. And smuggler's Cop copter as well draws us cards. That's another two life. So we're not just getting four life every turn cycle. We can potentially get a lot more than that. So we can speed up that clock, but, you know, it's really good. We then have Noxious Gearhulk, 4 and 2 black for a 5-4 with Menace, an artifact creature. When it ends the battlefield, you may destroy another target creature. If a creature is destroyed this way, you get to gain life equal to its toughness. So it's a little bit of life gain, but most of all, it's a decent, bo uh, decent bit of removal as well. Another creature that gets added to our board and takes one off the board. So we can tilt quite nicely with a Noxious Gearhulk. The 5-4 with Menace as well. Um, if our opponent's not playing a very creature-focused deck, is usually a four-turn clock um, as a worst-case scenario, essentially, which is pretty sweet, as long as your opponent can't remove it, of course. We then get Kothafed, the Soul Hoarder. It's been a long time since I've played with this card, so I'm very excited to do so. So for four and two black, legendary creature, Demon. So it's a 6-6 six, six flyer, and whenever a permanent owned by another player is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you draw a card and lose one life. So it's nice little bit of card advantage. Notice it says permanent, so if our opponent sacrifices an evolving wilds, we draw a card, that kind of thing. If uh, our opponent's playing something like uh, Revolt and they're sacking their maps and things like that, we're going to start drawing cards and gaining life. So hopefully this is a decent card in the meta game. We're going to find out. So we'll see how that goes. And we're, um, just as it stands though, it's a 6-6 six, six for 6 with flying, which can close out the game in no time as well. So it's pretty sweet. Only running one of them because it's quite high on the curve and we're trying to do a lot of beatdown stuff. So we want to be hitting smaller creatures for the most part. And we're kind of getting into uh, expensive territory here as well. We then have a single copy of Ever After. So this is a... I'd say it's a bit of a hit and miss card, but it has potential to really hit hard under the right circumstances. So for four and two black, a sorcery speed, return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Each of those creatures is a black zombie in addition to its other colours and types. You get to put Ever After on the bottom of its owner's library, so we get to reuse it again, which is not bad. So... If we've got a Mindbender in our graveyard, we can grab that back. And we can also grab a Kothafed. So it's a 6 mana, gets a 6-6 six, six and a 5-5. Five, five. Unfortunately, Kothafed is a cast uh, ability for his uh, thing, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but we can also ever after a Gear Hulk and a Kothafed. But worst case scenario, we're getting two Gifted Aetherborns, which is, you know, 6 mana for two two threes with Death Touch and Life Link, which is still not that bad in all honesty. And Ever After goes straight back into our deck as well, so we can do it again at a later date. Finally, we've got Distended Mindbender, so for 8 mana, we can play a 5-5. And if we cast Distended Mindbender, we get to uh, target opponent, reveals their hand. We get to take a non-land card with converted mana cost 3 or less, and another card with converted mana cost 4 or greater. So we get to a potentially eat away at our opponent's hand, take 2 cards uh, maximum, uh, usually... One card minimum, but if they're running all lands, then, you know, the 
the discard was good enough anyway, you know. But it also has an added ability as well. We have to emerge. So five and two black. We get to cast this spell by sacrificing another creature. And we take the mana cost of that creature away from the emerge cost. And that's how much it costs instead. So in, in theory, we can potentially cast Distended Mindbender for two black mana. Two black mana for a 5-5 five five that takes two cards out of our opponent's deck is pretty sweet. We also have, right at the very beginning of our deck, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, we can use Scrap Heap Scrounger for that two mana to emerge that, and we can still pay the two mana to get it back again to do it later. So we're not losing any value from sacrificing our creature, because we are running a bit of a low uh, creature count. But some of those creatures are vehicles as well, so they're not actually counted on this list here. But we could sack a Sky Sovereign, for example, which would get us a two-mana Mindbender, that kind of thing. If we know what's in our opponent's hand as well, it's really good value. If we don't, then we get to make sure that the next cards that we play are not going to get interrupted by whatever he's got in his hand. And we can play in nice confidence that whatever we're doing is going to work out. Or not work out, but we know it anyway. So that's essentially the deck. On to the mana base. We've got 21 Swamps. It is mono black. speaks for itself. And three Rogues Passage, which allows us to make those really big creatures, those 5-5s five and those 6-6s, six unblockable, which can close out a game by itself. Uh, the Colourless Mana, I've never really had it be a problem. I've been mana screwed more than I've had uh, Rogues Passages actually be the problem why, um, why I can't cast anything. So running three copies of Rogues Passage isn't too bad. But if you do find that you end up drawing them far too often, then maybe you want to take one out and add an extra swamp. It's up to you. Anyway, guys, that's going to be the deck. Be sure to check out the matches that should be following very shortly after this, if not already. And be sure to like if you enjoyed the look of the deck. And subscribe for some more Magic Jewels content. Alright, guys. I will see you in the games. See you there.